Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, we're very excited to have Walter Lisecki uh, interviewing uh, with us today uh, from the University of Rochester. Walter's a student of Jeff Bigham and James Allen, and um, he's no stranger to many of us here. He's done two internships um, and was an MSR fellowship winner. Um, Walter also won Best Paper at WIS. 2014, um, and his work, is, which you'll hear more about in a minute, is related to continuous real-time crowdsourcing. So. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, uh, and thanks for having me out. So today I'm going to be talking about how we can use human intelligence to augment automated systems so that we can go beyond the boundaries of AI and even solve problems that neither people nor machines can alone. And the resulting intelligent systems can be used to solve current, uh, important problems today, such as providing better access technologies to people with disabilities, uh, but it can also scaffold future intelligent systems when we are thinking about how we build and train them. So why do we want intelligent systems in the first place? Well, we can do things like have more contextualized, natural interactions with computers. We can offload some of the low-level, tedious tasks that we have to do and focus more on our high-level goals. Uh, we can even convert one form of media to another, such as converting uh, speech to text in real time and with, closed, with closed captioning. Now, while these are really interesting uh, and they're very generalizable uh, impacts that these systems can have, I'm particularly interested in how we can use these technologies to actually help improve accessibility, whether that's uh, accessibility for low literacy or lowly, low technical literacy individuals who might need a more natural way to interact with information than the typical interfaces that we use, or even helping people with uh, disabilities, such as people with motor or visual impairments who need to control an interface that isn't necessarily as easy for them as it would be for us, uh, or even providing captions for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Now, the problem with all of this is that this requires uh, solving AI hard problems, right? These are problems like understanding intention in natural language or understanding the content of a visual scene. And we're just not there with automatic systems just yet. We need human-level intelligence. Uh, but fortunately, in recent years, kind of platforms like Mechanical Turk have come out and allowed us to actually access human intelligence and insight uh, very, very quickly using an API call. So now we can start to think about algorithms that integrate this human intelligence uh, as part of their function. And we'll call this human computation. Now, I said that you can do this quickly, but originally, actually, this took hours or days to get responses. And only in more recent work by folks at Rochester and MIT has it been shown that you can actually get this down to actually just a couple of seconds to get people to show up at a task. In fact, I, last year, I released some of the first publicly available tools that allow anybody, anybody to go in and, and recruit small groups of the small subsets of the crowd in advance so that we can have people on demand exactly when we need them. So we can get people to a task quickly, but it's very different to manage people in a computational process uh, if you compare that to you know, hardware, kind of more traditional sources of computation. And that's for a number of reasons. Uh, first, a lot of people really use these platforms because of the flexibility that they allow in the way that people work. So you can arrive at any time as a worker. You can pick tasks that are really the ones that you're interested in. Um, and nobody's saying that you have to stay around. You, know, you can leave whenever you want, which means that we might not know if a person's going to complete a task or come back for the next task that we would think of as, as being part of the series. And even once we get a response, uh, it's not necessarily true that we know what the skills of that individual are, how much effort they're putting in, maybe they're even trying to game the system. Uh, and sometimes people just make mistakes or have a system configuration that actually leads to them seeing the problem differently than we expected. So this means that we don't know if we're going to get our tasks completed. We don't know what order they're going to be completed in. And we really don't know what the quality of the answer is, even if we get it. <laughs> so the field is really focused on uh, how we can solve these problems by taking a task, breaking it down into small, context-free units of work that only take a few seconds or a few minutes to actually complete, which we call micro-tasks. <coughs> and then using that divisibility and that context-free nature to actually let workers on these platforms take the task in whatever order they feel is best. Now, 
this works pretty well. Um, but then we realize once we get these answers back, we don't have a good way to confirm that they're actually correct. In most cases, it's actually just as hard to confirm an answer is correct as it is to solve the problem in the first place. So instead, we're going to use the fact that these are small units of work that are to actually design easily comparable pieces. Uh, and what that means is that we can actually collect a set of responses to each of these questions and use a simple aggregation scheme such as voting to get a more reliable answer that we can, we can really have faith in. Now this basic idea has been used in a wide range of systems that we've seen so far. So things like coming up with arbitrary uh, images for arbitrary image labels uh, for images on the web, uh, answers to visual questions for blind users, even finding just the right moment to take a picture uh, with a smart camera. Uh, it's also been used for things that are non-visual, so just as an example, kind of NLP and linguistic tasks, finding linguistic annotations for text data sets, editing documents, or even translating those documents to another language. And this is really just a, a small sampling of the space here. Uh, there's a lot of work within the HCI and AI communities on this, these types of systems. Uh, and really, we've even seen in the past couple of years uh, an entire conference sponsored by AAAI, HCOMP, and, and even a, an HCOMP journal arise to support these, this community. But while microtasks are extremely powerful, they are fundamentally limiting the types of tasks that we can think about crowdsourcing and using human computation as part of the process. Because not everything can be broken down into these little pieces of work. So in this talk, I'm going to, claim, I'm going to make the claim that we can actually create real-time systems that support multi-turn interactions. Even though we have a very dynamic crowd, we can maintain context and we can maintain um, interaction with these systems. Now, I'm a systems builder, so I've built a number of large, web-based systems for coordinating workers in real time around a single task uh, over the last four years. And for each of these systems, we kind of look at a way that we can solve a very generalizable problem, a whole space of problems, while also solving a specific instance uh, of, a, of a challenge that we had not known that we could use crowdsourcing to solve before. And then for each one of the systems I've built, I've looked at you know, what are some of the other problems in that space, uh, of the actual application space, what are some generalizable properties about the crowd that we can use to inform the design of future systems? And even how do we get around some of the hurdles that we see in deploying these systems in real domains? So since I can't talk about all of this in one talk, I'm really going to focus on explaining how maintaining context is critical to a wide range of tasks. Um, then I'm going to introduce a new type of task. Actually, not microtask, but a continuous task that keeps people engaged for longer periods of time and goes beyond a lot of the assumptions that we made for microtasks. And then I'm going to talk about how this allows us to start thinking about going beyond the traditional impetus for crowdsourcing, which is we have a task that people are good at, but computers really aren't. And even looking at tasks that individual people are not necessarily good at. And I'll talk about some of where I want to go with this work in the future. So let's start with maintaining context. Uh, and I'm going to use the example of VizWiz, which is this system that was originally introduced in 2010 that allows people to, uh, blind users to take a picture, speak a question, and get an answer within about a minute, which at the time was, was state of the art. And I helped deploy this system in 2011. And the resulting data set of almost 80,000 images asked by thousands of blind users is, is really uh, fascinating for a number of reasons. But in this data, I found a set of cases where it really shows that microtasks are not the end all be all of uh, human computation. And I'm just going to give this one example here where a user asks, what are the cooking instructions on this TV dinner? This is actually a pretty popular class of questions. And understandably, the information needed to answer this question is very hard to frame for a blind user. There's no tactile feedback on the actual package that they're taking a picture of here, so they don't know that they didn't capture the cooking instructions. So when the system goes out and recruits a worker to answer this question, they say, well, I can't see the instructions. But then they usually will try to give a little bit of feedback on how this might be corrected. So they say, well, why don't you flip the box over? So the blind user flips the box over, again, takes a picture. But the system, but then they ask, so how about now? But the system doesn't necessarily recruit the same worker. It's not sure that that person is always going to be available. So instead, it goes back to the crowd, it posts another microtask, gets a different worker who then doesn't know the original question. So they say something very general, like, oh, well, it's a box of food. <laughs> <laughs> so the user goes in, fixes this, realizes what the problem was. They re-ask the question, take a picture again. Um, we go, the system goes, gets another worker. And they say, well, I can't see the answer, so why don't you flip the box over? 
<laughs> and these kind of thrashing interactions can actually uh, take a very, very long time. In fact, even though we get answers to each question back in about a minute, it turns out that this typically takes about 10 to 15 minutes before a user can actually get uh, an, an answer to their question or they just abandon the task altogether in this case. So the real core problem here is that the end user is trying to have a conversation with the system that maintains context when the system doesn't actually support that type of interaction. Um, so I'm going to focus in on this problem and look at how we can solve the challenge of actually holding a conversation that goes and takes multiple turns um, and maybe even t spans multiple sessions. We go away and we come back tomorrow and, and want to continue that conversation from where we were. So to explore this, uh, I looked at a, I created a system called Chorus, which actually is a virtual personal assistant powered by many crowd workers behind the scenes. Now to the end user, this actually just appears as a, a chat conversation with a single individual. They have a pretty standard instant messenger window and they're able to interact with the system. Now, behind the scenes, workers also uh, participate in this process of curating a kind of working memory. So these are important facts. It's kind of a predictive task where workers try to speculate on what will be important to future workers who are completing this task. So that might include capturing things like uh, allergy information or location information about the user that they've shared in the past. Now to actually hold a conversation, it's a little bit more complicated than just ch posting a chat message. Um, Instead, we actually have a collective process where workers are all proposing and voting on one another's answers. We essentially have a, a rolling voting scheme. And to incentivize people to give us the, the right answers, the best answers that they can, um, we have a mechanism that asks people to propose answers. And if they actually propose an answer that's correct, um, we'll give them 3,000 points. They don't get any points if other people don't agree that they have given a, a, a reasonable answer to this task um, or given the current task. Now, if, since it's a little bit easier to just vote for one of these answers than it is to actually go out and find information and, and bring it back, if a worker votes on an answer, then they'll get 1,000 points uh, if, again, that's marked as correct. And to make sure that people don't just randomly guess at uh, what the answer is if they don't know, uh, we also add in this kind of no-op bonus. It gives, us a, a little bit of a, gives workers a little bit of a reward for not doing anything. And of course, it's pretty easy to figure out when people are abusing this. Now, one of the nice things here about this incentive mechanism is that kind of behind the scenes, we're actually able to tune a single parameter to figure out the, the spacing between these rewards. And what that will effectively let us do is uh, dial in the uh, verbosity of the crowd. So how many different responses do we want? Do we want a large set of maybe creative responses, or do we want a pretty narrow set of highly reliable responses? Uh, and while there's some issues, if you look at the actual game theoretic um, uh, properties of this, mechanism, you do find that there are multiple equilibria, but empirically this actually does work to encourage people to, to propose uh, more or less answers. Now what does this all mean? In the end, it basically means that we can filter down the set of responses to just the ones highlighted in blue here. And we, we really remove things like, uh, like this line where somebody comes in right in the middle and says, well, how's everybody doing? <laughs> and that's clearly not what we wanted in the middle of the conversation. Uh, so other workers catch, uh, catch on to this and they filter out that response. So to the end user, we only see this consistent um, conversation that is actually accurate and is sensitive to the correct points in the conversation that we're talking about and actually what we've said in the past and how that, how that fits together. Now we brought a dozen users into a lab to actually study how the system worked. We gave them a, a high level objective of what they want to accomplish. We didn't give them a specific script since that kind of defeats the point. Um, and we ran this within subjects design study. Now the results were really interesting and I'm just going to give one example here to give a, a flavor of how some of this turned out. Uh, the user comes in in this case, asks about some activities that they want to do in Houston. Now they basically ask what the price is of doing this set of activities and after a little bit of clarification, the crowd is able to come back and tell them, okay, that'll cost $150. Now interestingly, well, that's the answer to the question that the user actually asked. A moment later, the crowd actually comes back and says, well, actually, there's a better answer. There is a, a city pass available from the local tourism office, and that'll allow you to do everything and actually a little bit more than what you were expecting, and it's cheaper. So this is an answer that the request of the end user did not actually expect to need, but it was kind of serendipitously found by the system, by this collective search process behind the scenes that can discover information even if the, um, the end user didn't ask about it explicitly. And because of this serendipitous information finding, we actually find that a majority of uh, our participants preferred 
chorus to a keyword search like Bing. Now, more quantitatively, we can also we also show that uh, this system is able to stay on topic. It's able to give reliable answers that are very accurate and answer what the what people are actually asking about. And interestingly, we're also able to recall 80% of the facts that were actually from a prior session. That means no workers were present when the user originally said a piece of information, but uh, they were able to recall it using this working memory window 80% uh, of the time. So we didn't have to re-ask. We didn't have to kind of rehash the same ground. So it is possible to support this type of multi-turn interaction, even though we have a very dynamic crowd behind the scenes that's constantly changing. And if we look at uh, the roles that we actually have people completing in the background, we have uh, given a question, some people who are going to propose a new answer, and others who are going to help filter that answer down so that we only forward the correct answers to the end user. Now, it's easy to see also how we can use the same structure to include things like dialogue systems. And it doesn't matter that this isn't a person now. If it produces the right answer, then humans will go in, filter this, and make sure that we're only giving good answers to the end user still. But if it produces a, an incorrect answer, in this case, this is the, the wrong city, although it sounds like the right city, <laughs> the same name, but it's a city instead of a region, then workers can check on this, find out it's not the right information, actually propose a new answer, and then filter that so that we know uh, the, the human answer is correct. And not only do we uh, prevent the system from ever giving the end user an incorrect response, we kind of s prevent the system from ever corrupting the end user's experience, um, we also get the advantage of actually having this as training data. So where we would have normally derailed the conversation and gone down a conversational path that doesn't really uh, fit what the end user wanted to accomplish, we can now stay on track and see what would have happened even after the system makes a mistake. And yet we still know we made a mistake because the system's answer was not voted on and, and forwarded. So this gives us kind of a new way to think about how we deploy and then train AI systems in the wild. So now I want to talk about a, a new kind of task, a continuous task that goes beyond a lot of the assumptions of microtasks and lets us solve uh, a whole new space of problems. And just as an example of something that I think we can't solve using microtasks alone, I'm going to use the example of uh, driving, driving a robot. Right? This is very important for home assistive robotics where you might have somebody with a mobility impairment who needs a little bit of help actually accessing things in their home. Um, but how would you control this with microtasks? Right? It's a naturally continuous space. We have to be able to sense the environment. We have to be able to listen to the user and decide what actually we want to do about that. We want to provide continuous control to this robot, which does not expect discrete input. And um, we have to actually be able to respond to events in the en environment as we encounter them. So as a, as a proxy for this home assistive robotics task, uh, I'm actually going to use this little off-the-shelf Rovio robot where uh, we have you know, a little bit of an obstacle in the way and we have to drive around the obstacle and get to a target. And instead of breaking this down into little pieces, we're actually going to give workers control of uh, an actual streaming video interface that's uh, from the front-mounted camera on the robot. And we're going to let them use the, the default controls that the system comes with, which are basically just arrow keys and a few other simple controls. The problem is if we do this and we give control to a single person, uh, what we find is something like this, where a majority of the time we actually fail to complete the task because people will join, give it a good first shot to solve the problem, and then maybe in this case you know, they, they fail to complete, they crash into a wall, and then they abandon the task. This is a, a top-down view of our, our setup in our lab. Um, with, a, with a trace of where this particular instance of the, the navigation task went. Now, this is because there are going to be, you know, there's going to be some noise in the system. Not everybody's going to want to stay around and complete this entire task. And if it's not easy to do, they might just have a higher rate of abandonment. If we use the fact that we have lots of crowd workers available to actually just pick a new one uh, from the crowd and, and let somebody else control whenever they abandon like this, uh, we get something like this. We find out there are trolls on the internet, basically. <laughs> so somebody here uh, navigates the, the robot almost to the target, goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and then abandons the task somewhere there a few minutes later, and finally a different worker will connect and, and finish the task. Now, <laughs> this of course was, was something that raised our completion rate in this case because eventually somebody will finish most of the time. But if we could drive this robot off a cliff, it's pretty problematic, right? <laughs> it only works here because you can't destroy the task, basically. 
So what we really want to do to make sure that we don't have this kind of uh, malicious input or kind of otherwise noisy input is usually aggregate people's responses, right? If we use vo simple voting in the case where we break something down into microtasks, we want to use something similar here. But a lot of the standard approaches for dealing with continuous input don't necessarily work here. And I use the example of if this, the robot drove up to a tree, it can go left, it can go right. Those are perfectly good options, but we don't want to average. Now, so instead we're going to take a, a vote, but that requires actually discretizing time. So this is going to be a much slower approach where we need to you know, wait for one second of input, look at the most popular answer, and then uh, use that to control the robot. And the problem is still that we're not picking a consistent stream of options that any one worker would have selected. So we get a lot of conflict early on here where when we're trying to decide how to get around uh, this barrier, do we want to go forward first or do we want to go to the left first, people end up thrashing a lot in this case. So that doesn't quite work. So to solve this problem, we're actually going to borrow a page from representative democracy. And we're going to pick one leader who's in control at any one time, but then not make that necessarily the same person over multiple periods in time. And I'll, I'll show you how this works briefly. Um, if we wanted to really solve this problem, we would have to solve this POMDP where we really want to get agreement between different workers' policies. But of course, we can't see what people would do at every point in time. And in fact, there are different representations in people's heads. So we actually don't even know exactly how the states line up with the real world. So this isn't very tractable. Instead, we're going to uh, try to approximate this by looking at people's input over time, comparing it to the rest of the group, and then picking essentially the most representative of the, uh, the group to be in control. So given we have some input and we have some funny properties of this input, such as we can't really assume that uh, these two up commands, just because they look the same, uh, are not necessarily the same. We can't assume they're the same because going forward a, a moment later might be a very different action than going up at, at the first moment. So instead, we're just going to bin this over a one second time period, look at each worker's set of inputs for that time period, and then use a similarity function here, uh, a cosine similarity, to actually uh, compare them to the rest of the crowd. Right? So we get some score of how similar they are to the rest of the, the individuals who are contributing. Uh, and then we'll use that score to actually update a weight. And we do this for every time point, and we do this for each worker in the crowd. Um, which means then at the at any given time point, we can just pick the highest weight worker and give them direct control as the kind of the representative leader for that period. And then as we keep updating these uh, weights, we'll get potentially a, a new person in control at any given you know, one second span, but we won't be interleaving people's input on a, on a finer grain scale. So the system I created to uh, do this was called Legion. And it, Legion was able to not just control a robot, but actually an arbitrary user interface by letting you select a portion of your desktop, give a natural language command for what you wanted completed, and then it would actually go about the task of completing that with the crowd. Uh, we've used this to control anything from office software to assistive keyboards for people with motor impairments, to even letting multiple people play a single player video game uh, collectively. Now the idea of actually being able to keep people involved in a task for a longer period of time also points to this idea of a new way to maintain context. Right? If we had one person here for the entire task, then they could remember what was happening. Same thing for the conversation. So to, to set up a little bit of a, a test for that, I actually used a video game setup. We created a custom map here. And basically the idea was we had people using Legion to control a video game character. And they were walking in this cyclic map. Um, it took, took about 30 or 40 seconds to get from one decision point to the next, and the decision they made was essentially push the white button or the black button, uh, depending on some prior instances that they saw. Now, we actually ran this for a full hour, and it turns out that we could complete this task, even though people were not present for more than a couple minutes at a time, we could complete this task consistently and reliably the entire time. Uh, here you see an input where there are a, a graph of people's input. You see workers on the y-axis there. And each red marking is uh, basically a point at which the uh, worker contributed some con uh, input to the system. And we see that you know, maybe a worker stays for a few minutes, and then they leave. And you know, somebody else joins for a few minutes, and then they leave. Um, but the way we were able to actually control this for a longer period of time is that if you look at when people actually join a task, versus when they start to contribute, we see that there's basically this um, synchronization period where they are watching what other people are doing to learn how to complete the task. And then they use that to uh, continue on with, in the same way. 
And, and this is kind of reminiscent of organizational memory from the behavior literature, where people, this is essentially the process that uh, organizations and societies actually use to pass traditions down and, and other types of, of behaviors. So this is, it really gives a, another interesting way to capture this idea of context. I've talked about so far two, di very, two very different ways to accomplish this idea or this uh, goal of maintaining context over time. So I want to zoom out for a little bit and talk about some of the more general framework that this fits into. Uh, specifically, if we wanted to create these systems, what is the, what is the architecture? What does it look like? Um, we're always going to need a way to divide these tasks either into small pieces or into actually roles that people synchronously uh, coordinate and complete. Um, we're also going to need a way to actually collect input from workers, an interface that lets us get input from contributors. And really, contributors could be human workers, or they could be automated systems that know how to do either all or a piece of this task. And in either case, we'll need reward schemes to make sure that systems are incentivized correctly or workers are paid fairly for their uh, efforts in the system. Then we're going to need to think about the communication channels between people and how we actually think about maintaining context without allowing collusion without allowing to people to really coordinate to the um, detriment of the incentive mechanism that we're using. And then we're always going to need to actually aggregate these responses. Whether we're thinking about controlling an interface or about holding a conversation, we don't want parallel uh, threads in existence. We really want a single control stream. We really want a single conversation. Um, so this idea of having a single input and a single output is kind of the uh, same idea as having a collective that acts like a single individual, which we'll call a crowd agent. And this idea kind of harks back to, or this formalism kind of harks back to um, the agent architectures that we see in the AI literature uh, in pre prior work. Now, this gives us a way to really think about how to design these systems in the future and how we can kind of design for interactivity specifically. So then I want to I go back to this example that I started with at the beginning of providing visual assistance. Uh, to blind users, and this problem that we saw where people were thrashing over kind of corrections and, and follow up questions, and think about how we can solve this using the CrowdAgent uh, framework. So, to do this, I create a system called View that actually engages the blind user with a crowd of workers who actually hold an ongoing conversation that you see on the left here um, about now not just a single image, but actually a streaming video. So, they can now give multiple corrections. They can stay around to see what the result of their feedback to the user was. And it, it makes it a lot faster to hone in on exactly where, where the correct information is. So if we're looking at tasks like finding nutritional information, ingredients, allergy information, things like that, uh, we can actually reduce the time that it takes on average from 10 to 15 minutes with uh, the prior single image VisWiz system down to about one or two minutes. So we're getting about an order of magnitude speed up here because of this interaction. OK, now everything I've talked about so far and really all of the prior work in the field has really focused on how do we complete tasks that people are good at. Um, but I want to go beyond that and actually look at cases where individuals might not necessarily be good at a given task that we want to complete, um, but computers aren't up to that task either. So we need to kind of start using the collective ability to go beyond what we can do individually. And as an example of this, I'll use uh, the problem of real-time captioning, which is, of course, a very important accommodation to, for deaf, of heart, deaf and hard of hearing users. Um, but it's really very difficult. We need a low latency, only a few seconds per word. I mean, that requires typing hundreds of words per minute because people speak very, very fast. And we need the input to be accurate. So if we take a, generally, if we take a person, Probably it is that they're not going to be able to do this task very well. I don't think any of us in this room could actually keep up uh, with trying to type this talk, for example, type out this talk. Now, um, I'm specifically going to focus on a classroom scenario where you have a single speaker and at least one person in the audience who needs this accommodation. And currently, uh, automatic speech recognition, while there have been some really amazing advances recently, is just not up to this task. Um, because of the variety of different speakers, the different speaker conditions, maybe the speaker has a cold, for example, um, the different lexicons that we might be using, the vocabulary that we might actually have in a given lecture, and the different acoustic properties of the environment that we're not sure of any of this in advance, uh, really makes this a very challenging problem. And automatic speech recognition does not reach the legal accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, for being a, a viable service here. So instead, the current state of the art is actually using people. In fact, it's, it's computer-assisted people. Um, professional uh, cart captionists are 
individuals who have trained for years to be able to type hundreds of words per minute within a few seconds of, of each word. But because of this training and because they're so rare, it means that they're very expensive. It costs a couple hundred dollars an hour to hire these people. And it, they're not easy to schedule because, again, if you have to find somebody with this rare skill, it could take 24 to 48 hours notice. And that's kind of the standard accommodation latency that you see in like a university setting, for example. Now, this not only means that it's difficult to afford these accommodations for, for people who have to actually provide them, disability service offices at universities, um, but it also means that we can't always access them. Not just because we have this, this lead time, but because of the cost itself. So a lot of times you'll see that universities don't actually uh, accommodate students if they want to work in teams after class. Right? The in-class is supported, but it's not a legal requirement to support after class, so this is not something that, that is typically done or, or feasible given the budgets of these offices. What we'd like instead is for students to have the ability to kind of walk into a class, walk into a, a group setting, and pull out their phone and get captions immediately. So to do this, I created a system called Scribe, which actually streams audio from a user's mobile device to a server that then breaks this task up over multiple non-expert workers, and then coordinates all of their input and aggregates it back together to provide a single caption stream uh, within a matter of a couple of seconds. Now, this means that we can make these captions available any time. In fact, because we're using uh, non-experts, they're highly available. They're also cheaper. We can pay students $10 to $15 an hour. This is not something that they've spent you know, years training for. It's just anybody who can hear and type. Uh, so it, to get a group of people to do this, it still costs about a quarter the price of a professional. And we can now use students or other uh, volunteers who might actually have subject matter expertise. So if we're capturing computer science, computer science talk or mechanical engineering talk, we can find somebody who actually knows something about that domain rather than has a specialty just in, in typing. But how do we actually coordinate people to do this task? Um, the simplest high-level version of this would be to think about round robin, right? So we start with one person, give them a few seconds of audio that we want them to type, and then say, don't worry about typing while somebody else is, is taking care of the task. So we'll hand this to the second person, say, okay, now you have a few seconds to, to type, and so on and so forth. And eventually the first person will catch back up so we can integrate them back in and have them type a few more seconds of what they hear. Now, of course, this type of coordination requires a lot of uh, interface accommodations for figuring out how to coordinate people and actually prompting people to input at the right time. So I want to show you uh, a little bit of how Scribe does that in this video. And specifically, I want to focus on the fact that typing will lock in. So as people type, you'll see it kind of just go gray. They can't go back and edit because this takes far too long and increases the latency by too much. Um, it also provides a lot of cues to type and some feedback in, the term, in terms of bonus points and, and rewards. Uh, to encourage people when they're doing a good job. And this can map to, to money in the case that we're actually using mechanical Turk workers or other paid crowds to uh, contribute to this task. You also notice that the volume will increase and decrease to help uh, more with the saliency and these, uh, this idea of queuing people to type at a certain time. And that's not working. Yeah. Okay. So this is supposed to have audio. I'm not sure why. Television, ah. as you know, is uh, one way. And Generally, entertainment oriented and paid for through advertising, although increasingly by subscriptions now with cable television. And finally, the current <clears throat> big thing, the internet, which uh, came to us starting in 1969. Now, the internet itself has been. All right. See, uh, a little bit less content than I expected there, but it's, uh, you get the idea. We're prompting people that you have a bit of a salient cue in the volume, as well as some direct visual cues. Now, as you see here, actually, people still make mistakes. And it's principal and it, use being. Stop that. OK. <laughs> um, people still make mistakes uh, because this is still a challenging task, even for those, those few seconds. If somebody speaks too quickly, we actually go beyond someone's working memory. Um, and to make this easier, I looked at what people who do offline captioning actually would would do. And it turns out that they slow down the audio. Now, offline capturing is the same task as real-time capturing, but basically without the time constraint. If you give me the captions tomorrow, that's perfectly fine. So while slowing down the audio works in that case, it's not necessarily true that it can work in real time. You'll obviously fall behind. Um, so we'll use the fact that we have multiple people, not just a single captionist, to actually speed or to slow down what one person is hearing to, say, half speed. 
that's for, just for the section that they're actually typing, basically. So if they're supposed to be typing a certain segment, we play it at half speed. Uh, if they're not, we take advantage of the fact that people can listen a lot faster than they can type. And we actually speed it up to maybe one and a half times while other people are responsible for the content. This means that actually we can play at the audio at half speed for everyone while they're supposed to be typing. So everyone hears it slowed down. And you still have that context because we can't remove the context in between these segments. It turns out people are actually worse uh, or almost as bad as computers when you do this. So by allowing people to kind of hear a more approachable version of the audio, we can actually increase the recall rate and the precision uh, pretty significantly on these tasks. And what's even more amazing is that we actually see a decrease in the latency. So we're slowing down the audio, and yet we're getting faster responses. And, and the high level reason for that, after we went back and did uh, interviews with a lot of the workers we were engaging for this task and actually looking at some of the data, it turns out that Basically, when the audio is too fast for somebody to keep up with, what they'll do is they'll listen, they'll memorize everything, and then they'll start typing after their segment has stopped playing. So basically in the little context period where somebody else is typing. That means we pay this shift penalty where we don't have anybody, we don't have the person typing at all until after uh, we've stopped the audio clip. Turns out when we are able to slow this down, it becomes a more tractable task and people can type each word as it comes in more often. So we get this decrease in latency. So I want to show you uh, quickly what that looks like. This will be another video. Um, it's basically the same as before, but now with this playback speed adjustment. Communication among people. Next network after that was the television network, which uh, arose during my lifetime. Uh, and television, as you know, is a one way and generally entertainment oriented and paid for through advertising, although increasingly by subscriptions now with cable television. And finally, the current <coughs> big thing, the internet. Current big thing is the internet. <laughs> um, okay, so people can adapt very quickly to this, can follow along, and can actually uh, complete the captioning task easier. But there's still a pretty challenging task here. People can still fall behind. They might miss a word. They might uh, not know a certain word, so it's pretty hard to caption it. But we can't scale the same approach that we have. We certainly have a lot of people available now because it's anybody who can hear and type. But we can't scale this division and round robin approach to use too many people. Because if you imagine you know, a tenth of a second to a whole large set of people, the tenth of a second of audio is not making it easier to caption this, this content. So instead what we're going to do is we're actually going to get redundant input. We have a few seconds per worker, but now we're going to get a few workers per few second segment. And collectively, this uh, allows people to very accurately and very, uh, with, with a lot of uh, high recall, excuse me, um, actually provide these captions. So 95% of the words that are said we can capture with 87% precision, and we can actually do this in under three seconds of worker time uh, per word latency. This is actually uh, kind of on par precision with a professional and, and better recall and latency. Yeah, so the cost, of course, does increase. We had a, kind of a lot of flexibility in the price we were paying, where we were already at a quarter. Um, we can do this with a combination of not just workers, but actually also ASR, which I'll, I'll get, mention a little bit. But um, it's still much cheaper than providing this using professionals, and it's much more available and, and higher accuracy because of this expertise, so, or subject matter expertise specifically. Um, but of course, the problem with it is that now we have multiple streams of captions, which as we talked about before, it does not work for many applications. And it turns out if you bring students in to actually try to read captions, read maybe 10 seconds of captions, it takes them 45 seconds if those are parallel captions. Um, they can reconstruct what was being said, but it's so slow that we lose our real-time constraint just on the, the reading alone. So instead what we want to do is actually add this combiner phase where we're going to merge all of the uh, words that people have said back together and, and create a caption that is kind of easy to read, and a single caption. And we're going to do that using multiple sequence alignment, which is this process that was originally used in computational biology, actually, to realign genome sequences. Um, and while this will figure out where we have gaps and where we're missing words, and maybe even allow us to align words that we want to compare and, and denoise, in case somebody had like typo, for example, um, it, unfortunately, it, all of the existing work on this has been offline. So these are kind of dynamic programming algorithms that allow us to do a late binding answer, but we have to have all the input that we want to align first, which doesn't work for our real-time case. So instead, uh, I came up with a graph-based approach that actually constructs a graph as we see words based on which words we see uh, immediately next to each other in different workers' input, weights the edge, and we can actually go back with the language model and reweight the edges so that when we find the 
highest probability path, um, this results in a pretty reliable caption. Um, and while this worked pretty well and actually works in a much, mon uh, much more general constraints, uh, more recently we've been using this A star search based uh, approach with a, a beam heuristic that actually lets us more uh, accurately control the computational and time resources that we use for a given alignment and more uh, integrate the language model in a more principled way. So this gives us our single uh, caption. And we've actually been able to show that this is very useful and even uh, use this in real domains. So we captioned a number of conferences, including, w or, uh, including assets last year, uh, which you see here. There's basically our, our screen on the left. We're captioning for the entire conference, and you know, the speaker's off to the right somewhere there. Um, and interestingly, instead of hiring Mechanical Turk workers, or instead of bringing people uh, explicitly into this session to provide captions, we were able to go into the audience ask for volunteers and get five students who had never used the system before about five minutes in advance of this session. They all sat down and they were able to actually create or produce pretty good captions <clears throat> even with only a few minutes notice. And this really points to the idea of kind of democratizing uh, access, uh, access technology, right? Now anybody who's interested, friends, peers, family members, can help with this task, whereas before it really wasn't uh, viable to do so. I have a question about how that works. Yes. So, People were in the session, so did they have to like wear headphones or something so they could hear the slow? Right. In this case, we weren't using the uh, the time warp uh, okay. for the in class or in uh, session participants, but you could imagine doing exactly that and okay. using headphones. Yeah. Uh, so it was a little bit more challenging a task. We didn't get that one uh, <laughs> one bit, and mostly we did that because there is still uh, in this setup some uh, uh, server latency. Basically, we have to stream the audio to our server that warps it and send it back. So we didn't want to add that like one second of latency. Um, and, yeah. And presumably because I'm attending the talk, it's something that I'm interested in, but did you get a sense of the people that were doing it, how much it detracted from their experience? Yeah, so that's, a, that's a very good question. We, it is often difficult to follow content. Uh, we we're only using five people here, so that's still a, a reasonably intensive task. Um, one way that we've looked at, so here you do see a little bit of loss. If we were using four people, it would be significantly more. Um, what we found is basically if we want to use volunteers in a classroom where we actually have students, and it turns out a, a vast majority of students would be willing to help appear uh, as long as it didn't hurt their understanding of the content. So what we can usually do is find you know, 30 students in a classroom and make it so that you only have to type a few seconds every couple of minutes, which then makes it very easy to follow along and it doesn't detract at all. Yeah. Um, and and the, the general approaches that we use here can actually generalize to things like uh, coding behavioral video in a uh, much shorter amount of time than it would usually require if you were using an undergrad, so a couple minutes instead of a couple of weeks in this case. Um, and even to activity recognition settings where we actually need high speed action labels to ensure we understand what's going on in an environment in real time. Uh, and kind of the, the high level takeaway is that instead of selecting a single person or a single answer to actually include in our final output, we want to synthesize our answer from a set of different people. And this allows us to go beyond what one person is able to do and actually stitch back together something that, that is uh, higher quality. So now I want to talk a little bit about where I want to go with this work uh, in the future. And I really started this talk by describing how microtask has allowed us to use human computation in settings that computers can't operate alone. We can get labels to images. We can answer a lot of these simple tasks. It works great for batch process tasks or anything where we only need a single response. Um, and in this talk, I've shown how we can actually greatly expand the space of problems we can use human computation in by looking at continuous tasks and how we support interaction over multiple turns of uh, interaction with an end user. But we're still looking at these systems that we create, these intelligent systems that we create, as tools. Um, and I really want to look at, in the future, how we can use kind of mixed initiative principles to go beyond this idea of asking a question and getting a single answer and actually work more deeply with the crowd and actually get the crowd's insight into problems as we work, even when we don't know that we had a question that needed answering. And it's just a, a, a one space that I'm going to explore this in. I'm going to use the example of um, smart prototyping, which is basically taking a, an initial napkin sketch and seeing how fast we can turn it into a functional prototype. Um, so in in work that's appearing at Kai this year, I built the system Apparition. You see a little video here. And it's basically a platform for exploring intelligent prototyping tools. Um, the user can sketch a rough version of what they want while describing it out loud. 
And the system will automatically convert their sketches to real elements as, as you go. So this is basically like describing it on a whiteboard and ending up with a more realistic interface. Here we're prototyping a simple like, platformer game. You can think of Mario. And the user is able to describe some things, sketch some things, and the crowd is working behind the scenes to actually make this into real content or, or update the grass that it's green in this case. Now, and after, after about a minute, we have a sketched prototype, but we want to add functionality. So the user creates a character, describes a basic behavior, so it should follow where they click, and within three seconds, uh, the character actually has that behavior. So you can see they click, and the character follows where they said to go. Now, they can keep using this behavior, and they don't have to keep respecifying it every time they interact with the system. The system remembers uh, how it's supposed to work. And you can see here they play a simple game to get across to the other side. And is that because the crowd workers are, have programmed code for the behavior behind the scenes? Or is that because the crowd workers are doing like Wizard of Oz in real time? So, so here we're looking at basically a collective Wizard of Oz pro, um, process where people are coordinating to control different pieces of the uh, interface. And in fact, we have a lot of new interaction techniques that make this possible, where prior synchronous drawing uh, systems actually didn't support uh, truly synchronous editing. Right? So things like Google Draw, for example, uh, don't really work in this setting. We have a lot of different things to coordinate workers, but it is kind of a more freeform task than typical. And um, we're able to actually get some more flexible system support as well. So not just workers uh, coordinating, but actually also the, the system tries to do some gesture recognition uh, for the drawn elements and actually will uh, post a to-do item here on the, on the side uh, when it doesn't know so that workers can, can take that task and, and help complete it. So this is really cool. We're still, again, this is, this is still using the idea of using the system as a tool. So I want to go beyond this and look at how we can take some of these prototypes we've created and let the crowd help us create um, improved interfaces. And that's maybe in this case importing more thematically appropriate content. So we don't actually have to go back, but the crowd can help us figure out what makes the most sense uh, in the setting we described. Uh, and this can actually be very useful for blind developers who might actually need otherwise um, help from sighted peers to come up with like, their finalized version of their interface, even though they have an intuition of what they want. We can also use the fact that the crowd themselves understand why certain things happen. You can see, uh, and, and start to capture that idea more formally. So maybe things like collidable surfaces, where you know, we have the box in the ground or something that uh, the character can't pass through, but, but actually the sun's in the background. And people understand that intuitively, but the system just sees polygons. Um, we can also capture the idea of playable characters and maybe some of the relationships and actions that they can carry out. Um, and even what happens when those actions are taken and they interact with one another. And we can use this idea of using the crowd as a, a formalization layer to help the system better understand what's happening in the world to actually start to predict what might happen in the world. And if we keep a, a small frontier, we can start to borrow a page from uh, kind of predictive parallel computation and try to guess what will happen, pre-compute this using people on the, in the crowd. So go ask what might happen if I reach this state. And when the user actually gets to that state, we can actually have a zero latency response. Right? The computer already knows, it just has to apply what's about to happen. So we can start looking at zero latency crowds in the same way that you're going from hours to minutes and then minutes to seconds, open up whole new spaces of applications. I think actually zero latency or a few millisecond responses will do exactly the same. Um, and then kind of behind the scenes, how can we use this understanding that both the system and the crowd has about the application domain to actually template out code or generate code uh, either from scratch or from demonstrations or even from, or even help uh, workers and users import generalized examples from offline crowdsourcing platforms and community exchanges uh, into specific examples that we want to work automatically. And I think these mixed initiative systems will help us go uh, beyond just a naive mixing of these three con contributors and actually look at how we can best take advantage of the strength of the crowd, the creativity of the crowd, the creativity of the end user, and some of what AI can do uh, to understand and, and reason about the domain. So I've talked about how we can support ongoing interactions with the crowd in this talk um, and really focused on the fact that consistency is key to success. We need to be able to do that. And, and all the systems I showed, we need to have consistent output that doesn't conflict with itself, but actually and it respects kind of the, the progression to get to that point in the interaction. Um, 
And to design systems that do this, I've introduced the idea of real-time crowds actually as a crowd agent and introduced an architecture for how we can create these systems. And I'm really excited about how we can support richer and richer interactions with the crowd via things like mixed initiative principles. Thanks. So, when I, so kind of question, kind of a comment. So you, I saw your interactive with crowd-powered systems when you were driving the robot around. And in many ways, it felt like Twitch plays Pokemon. Um, did you find that there was a way to kind of exclude trolls out of your system automatically? Yeah, so, so one thing that uh, drove me a little nuts about <laughs> Twitch plays Pokemon, well, it's an awesome example. Basically, this is uh, a game that was set up, I guess, last year? Yeah. It was, um, that allowed a lot of people to play basically a Game Boy version of Pokemon. But it was 10,000 people all playing at once and kind of just throwing input at the system. And I think it had one of two modes, right? It's kind of mob control and uh, vote, although it wasn't clear exactly how they were voting. I think they were also binning by time. Um, so this was basically two of our baselines. One, one thing I didn't show is that mob was actually something else we tried that doesn't really work because you, again, lose consistency over time. Um, what we see is that when we're actually learning the weights and using the, the crowd's collective kind of voice to actually vet workers, we are able to very easily identify people who are trying to, to differ from the rest of the set. And, and we can't guarantee that those people are malicious, but since things like Pokemon or this navigation task are, are relatively straightforward in terms of making progress, people who are not uh, contributing in that direction are pretty easy to detect. So yeah, we can do that role. Yeah. I was just wondering if you could define, again, what exactly you meant by mixed initiative crowdsourcing, because I wasn't totally clear on why some of the earlier systems you talked about didn't count as mixed initiative. Like, it seemed like the one where the blind people took video while the chorus of workers were dialoguing with them <laughs> seemed similar to the the... Yeah, no, example. so that is, um, that is actually kind of a nice example of a mixed initiative interaction, but it's not something we necessarily designed for. It was kind of a byproduct of the way we designed the incentive mechanism. And because we had this rolling voting process where we didn't just restrict people to kind of a single contribution, we were able to get this insight. I mean, same thing with the chorus example where we come back and actually suggest the, the city pass even when the user didn't ask for it. So I really think it's about focusing on uh, trying to design the systems rather than taking advantage of kind of what naturally occurs in some ways, right? So, so yeah, in those systems we weren't. That wasn't an initial attention. And do you think that in systems like that, is it important that the, the end user believes that they're actually interacting with a single actor or with an intelligent computer system versus that they know they're interacting with a crowd of workers? Is, yeah. is it important to hide that fact from them or not? Um, so we were mostly focusing on hiding this fact in the context of uh, trying to make sure that we didn't have multiple threads of interaction, right? It's confusing to actually hold multiple conversations at the same time. So from that standpoint, we don't want to feel like we're talking to a set of people. But at the same time, uh, once we have some of this filtering, it's actually, it turns out that it's actually useful to end users to include some information about how confident the system is. Um, so we can tell people, yeah, there's multiple people behind the scenes, and this is like the level of agreement on a given answer. And people find that informative for, for selecting. So, so it's a combination. Yeah. So crowdsourcing research I mean, has exploded over the past several years. What do you see going forward? Do you see that the types of tasks and activities that people are applying to crowdsourcing staying somewhat consistent, or do you anticipate that we're going to see this sort of deviate off in a new direction? Um, I think we've only seen a fraction of the actual applications that we could create. Even this idea of moving towards more mixed initiative systems and actually collaborating with our intelligent systems is something that uh, really hasn't been done yet, even though we keep claiming, OK, we, we have an intelligent system. right? <laughs> it, it is very much designed from the tool perspective. So I think uh, there will be a lot of brand new applications, not just kind of um, solidification of, of uh, prior work. Um, I also think that hopefully the platforms will become better and make it a little bit easier to, to work in this space, actually. What 
do the platforms need to be embedded? Yeah, well, right now, for example, Mechanical Turk really doesn't have great real-time support. We were kind of hacking the system a little bit to pre-recruit our own crowd that has these properties, um, which is very hard to scale and very hard to, it's actually, it's interesting, it's, it's hard to scale and it's hard to one off. <laughs> There's something like mid, middle level um, where we need some set of workers, but we don't need too many. Um, and I think that if the platform actually natively supported this kind of task routing uh, to individuals who maybe are available at, at a given time, or at least put, allowed people to actually be kind of on call, um, we would see more people doing work in the space actually. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the works you presented kind of embed the crowd in, from the user's perspective, pretty intimate settings, like in, in um, for blind people, it might be their bedroom, or in a um, transcription sense, the content might be something that you don't necessarily think you want to spread to the entire crowd. Have you thought about like privacy? Or, or yeah. Yeah, so we've actually done some of the first work in this space with uh, Jamie and AJ, actually. <laughs> um, where we were looking at how might you attack these systems, how might malicious workers in these systems actually be a threat to the end user. Uh, and while we are not seeing high levels of kind of malicious users or people who would actually do bad things with the information now, uh, certainly that will grow over time. Um, it's, it's also true that a single individual is not necessarily the biggest threat because a lot of these denoising uh, properties can can at least prevent bad answers. So again, in the, the blind user case, where we actually want to make sure that we don't misinform the end user, uh, that often gets filtered out with kind of the same approaches that we're using here. If we want to prevent people from seeing it, we're now looking at how we can create intelligent filters that actually use people but never reveal that information, um, which I can talk about a little bit more offline if you're, if you're curious. But, yeah. You <laughs> You mentioned zero latency crowd. Yes. How is that possible? Don't bug my question. <laughs> 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 they are very unsafe. Um, right, so the idea here would be that as we start to formalize more and more of the information about kind of the domain that in this case we've just created, we just sketched out, uh, the system can start to basically run a planning process over what might happen. So where could we go from this point that the user has reached? Where do we expect to go kind of based on prior interactions? Uh, and once we can start to narrow down that, the size of that guest set, um, we can start to actually pre-compute, maybe on a three-second frontier, if that's our current latency, what might happen, get that answer, and then have it ready when we reach that state to, to immediately fire. So we're talking about a few milliseconds, whatever it takes the computer to now respond, rather than whatever it would take to, to be surprised by that uh, new state, then go out and get an answer uh, for that exact moment. Somewhat related, somewhat different, and also related to Corey's point about where these things are going, right? So one of the things you talked about a lot in this real time and that affects interactive systems is latency, right? And trying to get that down the way to zero. And so I, I guess also I've seen in the in the number of different things you've done is that some of them still feel like you have to do specialized to deal with this problem and do this time warping kind of solution and find the right way to mesh. This other problem is different, like. Do you envision that we will have like sort of more general solutions to this problem of reducing latency, or is it going towards just building like a tool set of 58 different little kinds of things that we like? You know, like are there generalizable solutions? Is it kind of every new problem is still a new one? Are we in this exploration phase? Like, what's your sense of? Yeah. So I think um, what I focused on here is it, kind of in the the broadest sense focusing on the types of input and output. So going back to this crowd agent architecture, what types of input can we deal with? So if it's a, a stream, a stream that's faster than people can individually contribute to, that kind of thing. So I think there are those broad classes of if we see the same problem or the same kind of uh, properties of the problem, we can use the approach. There are also going to be these like more fine-grained optimizations like time warp where we look at how people complete this task or some of the specific human factors to completing that, that task um, that we can then augment this with. So Scribe is a good example in that it's a reasonably general approach and actually something we've done very different things like activity recognition using a very similar process. Um, but of course there we didn't use things like time warp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take it in a, in a different direction. Um, so Mechanical Turk is related to crowdsourcing crowd workers. So it's about getting the crowd to work to help me complete a task. Now, the robot driving is a little different. The same with the Twitch Pokemon game. That's more sort of 
crowd participation. So it's not that I'm doing a task for you, it's like I want to play this game with the crowd. Yeah. Um, has there been much of those types of activities where it's not that I'm just working for somebody, that I'm, I'm doing this for my own enjoyment with other people? And, yeah. Um, yeah, so not so much within the human computation space. Um, you do see kind of other things in crowdsourcing that maybe are, you can even think of things like learner sourcing or uh, community events, right, as, as yeah. a type of this, right, yeah. where we're all working towards a common goal, but there's not necessarily a computational process involved in that. Um, I think that it is interesting that the like, jointly play a game setup in Legion is uh, self-directed. It's not necessarily true that the, the robot driving was, right? So there we actually were specifying the goal. So we're looking for a process. Yeah, yeah but no, but the gaming right. is, is a very good example using the same system. Uh, and there we were actually, of course, not hiring people, but letting people, you kind of saw in the picture, um, uh, sit on a couch, right, and collaboratively play this game. So I, I think that we can transplant some of those ideas from uh, the computational space to kind of the more general self-directed crowdsourcing. I also think that uh, the systems like Apparition are trying to use this like one level abstracted computational process where we know people are computing something. Like, computing here using air quotes basically just as their mental process mm -hmm. uh, to get to the response that we need, and that's integrated in a certain way. But uh, there it's, it's much more undirected, and I think what we can learn from kind of teamwork settings uh, informs how we do the coordination uh, in, in settings like Apparition where we don't have, I know I need to do X, right? It, it's kind of up to the workers to figure out what they need to do. Last comments? One of the last on <laughs> but I, well, so, I mean, That just sort of made me think about, um, do you have thoughts from the worker's perspective of what it's like to do these small tasks or participate in these things? You know, because when you're thinking about playing the games, that's sort of us being it rather than thinking of these right, right, right. external workers. Um, yeah, I mean, it varies a lot by type of task. So what we see is a lot with a lot of the assistive technology work, people are actually um, even more engaged than by micro tasks and feel like they've contributed a bigger piece when we use continuous tasks. But in general, kind of knowing that they're doing good <laughs> uh, is, is something that helps. Um, I think that in general from the worker side, kind of this line of work we're looking at kind of more continuous interaction with the system also avoids a lot of the interruption problems that we see in traditional micro task crowdsourcing. Uh, and actually, there's a paper at Kai this year that looks at some of the kind of detrimental effects on workers to having their workflows constantly interrupted in different ways that are, are pretty common currently when we use microtasks. Uh, and the punchline is that can take people up to twice as long, which of course they're not paid differently for. Um, so with just a little bit of the wrong routing, uh, it can essentially cut their, their effective pay rate in half. So this is trying to get away from some of that, uh, some of those problems. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.